What has happened, I think, is that we have now have a mutant virus which has now found a host to which there is no immunity, which has not been exposed before. And so it has basically free range. It can replicate and it can pass from one person to another. So it is now proving to be very, very effective. University of Hong Kong pathologist Dr. John Nichols is describing the 2003 discovery of SARS coronavirus 1, which originated in China's Guangdong province. Among virologists and other infectious disease experts, South China is well known as an incubation chamber for all manner of respiratory infections and massive outbreaks of influenza. The outbreaks are serious enough and frequent enough to disrupt commerce in Hong Kong and the surrounding region, one of the most densely populated areas on Earth. The Chinese government was aggressive in investigating these viruses. Professor Liu Zhanwan was one of the government researchers based in a Guangzhou hospital about 80 miles from Hong Kong. In November 2002, Liu left the city. When Liu bought his bus ticket for Hong Kong, he knew there were hundreds of patients being treated in southern China for the new disease, and that this information was a Chinese state secret. Most reports say Liu was on his way to a wedding but an Italian newspaper claims his plan was to meet with a Beijing contact to report the result of his research. The disease that Professor Liu was treating in secret was a new form of pneumonia, possibly caused by a virus jumping species from a bird or animal. While on his 2003 bus trip out of Guangzhou, Liu developed a fever and eventually spread the disease from his Hong Kong hotel across the city, then to Vietnam and Toronto. Approximately 8,000 people were infected with SARS coronavirus 1. One in 10 of them died. By July 2003, the deadly outbreak was contained, but China's secret was out and the global hunt was on for a vaccine to halt the lethal new SARS coronavirus. Within the year, approval was given to begin construction on a new global virus research center, a biosafety level four laboratory in China's Hebei province, the Wuhan Institute of Virology. At this moment, you can't say conclusively, but what the Chinese did behaviorally, okay, which is undisputed, um, is they allowed a offensive-like vector uh, uh, in terms of its pathology, you know, and virulence to escape China and spread around the world. It took 11 years and $44 million to construct China's first level four biosafety laboratory. But less than a year after it went online in 2018, U.S. Embassy officials in China were sounding the alarm, telling the Trump administration the lab was limited by a shortage of the highly trained technicians and investigators required to safely operate a BSL-4 laboratory. Then, just 18 months later, in July 2019, only two years after achieving level four accreditation, the Chinese government was asking for bids to renovate the lab's critical hazardous waste treatment system. The first indication something had gone wrong at the Wuhan Institute. On Thursday, September 12, 2019, at midnight, local time, Wuhan University issued a statement announcing lab inspections. Between 2 and 3 p.m., the lab's viral sequences and database were taken offline. Later that day, some of the viral coding was deleted. The second indication something had gone wrong in Wuhan. The fall of 2019 saw a series of coincidental events. Between September and October 2019, Researchers at Harvard, cleverly using satellite photos, showed a noted increase in cars on hospital parking lots in Wuhan. This satellite image of Hubei Women and Children Hospital was taken in October of 2018 with 393 cars in the parking lot. A full year later, 714. On October 18th in New York, just weeks before the public announcement of the new COVID outbreak, Elite scientists and public health officials assembled for a high-level pandemic exercise. And the reason we called it Event 201 is we knew eventually one of those days, one of those events would be the big one. And that big one would really challenge our capacity to respond. And to respond to the big one, we do need to have all hands on deck. Ladies and gentlemen, 
please rise for His Excellency Xi Jinping, General Secretary of the CPC Central Committee. Also in mid-October, Wuhan hosted the World Military Games. 9,308 military athletes, including 67 world and Olympic champions from over 109 countries, will participate across 27 different sports in the host city of Wuhan. When those military athletes return to their homes, they spread the virus around the world. December 8, 2019 is the date many health officials say news of the outbreak began circulating in the Chinese public health community. On December 31st, a U.S.-based open access platform called ProMed posted a Chinese media report of the outbreak. WHO officials saw the post and asked for confirmation from the Chinese government. Only then, did China tell the world about the outbreak of SARS-CoV-2? And it was only when the Chinese Communists knew an investigation would ensue that Wuhan authorities shut down and disinfected the city's wet market, which was, according to them, the likely source of the virus's jump from animal to human. The wet market origin story has been entirely discredited. What remains open is how the Chinese virus was released. You should come to Chinatown. Precautions have been taken by our city. Uh, we know that there is a concern about tourism traveling all throughout the world, uh, but we think it's very safe to be in Chinatown and hope that others will come. By the end of January, China had quarantined 15 cities, putting 50 million people in lockdown. There were reports of Chinese officials using brutal measures to strictly enforce the lockdown, including forcibly removing people from their homes and welding their doors shut. It took weeks for the rest of the world to react to the new SARS coronavirus health threat. If it's minimal and slow, what is going outside can also be controlled easily. In the United States, Democrats were obsessed with impeaching President Trump, whose trial began February 9th. Despite the pressures of impeachment, President Trump's administration took action. The president has signed a presidential proclamation temporarily suspending the entry into the United States of foreign nationals who pose a risk of transmitting the 2019 novel coronavirus. Meanwhile, also in late January, Dr. Anthony Fauci, a 50-year veteran of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, NIAID, was telling Americans not to worry. We have already started at the NIH and with many of our collaborators on the developing of a vaccine. I anticipate with some cautious optimism that we will be in a phase one trial within the next three months. The collaborators to which Fauci referred, including the notorious Peter Daszak, had been working on a SARS-CoV-1 vaccine since its outbreak in 2002. Beyond putting people on ventilators, no other treatment options were offered. The world would need to wait for a vaccine. We're saying they are gain-of-function viruses because they were they're animal not. viruses that became more transmissible in human, and you funded it. And you, you admit the truth. You are implying that what we did was responsible for the deaths of individual. I totally resent that. Could that. Have and if anybody is lying been. here, Senator, it is you. American scientists at NIAID and their Chinese collaborators have been interested in coronaviruses since the early 2000s, even before the SARS-CoV-1 outbreak. So before the 2019 SARS-CoV-2 outbreak, there'd been an ongoing 20-year holy grail search for a coronavirus vaccine. But in 2014, there were so many accidents at the CDC involving mishandled pathogens, the National Institutes of Health announced a ban on gain-of-function research. In a discussion among infectious disease researchers, one scientist voiced his support for the ban. The question is whether we should do it. We were trying to enhance certain types of function, in this case, mammalian transmissibility, in pathogens that we're genuinely very scared about. We have every reason to be very scared. And I think this discussion is an example of why we need a moratorium. By 2017, after only three years, the highly controversial gain-of-function research was restored, 
under a carefully administered but largely secret review process. In contrast, there was a troubling lack of interest in identifying existing therapeutics or developing new therapeutics to treat SARS-CoV-2 symptoms. There are currently no drugs approved by the FDA to prevent or treat COVID-19. The medical community's approach appeared to be, stay at home until you're sick enough, then we'll put you in the hospital on a ventilator. That prescription pushed thousands of people onto ventilators into intensive care units where they died, especially if they were elderly or overweight. Democrats busied themselves undermining President Trump's vaccine plans. In the vice presidential debates, Vice President Mike Pence rebuked Kamala Harris for creating vaccine hesitancy. The fact that you continue to undermine public confidence in a vaccine, if the vaccine emerges during the Trump administration, I think is, is unconscionable. As health officials push for a vaccine, doctors on the ground, especially in poorer countries, are finding ways to treat their patients, but their successes were being suppressed. Despite the backlash, in an interview with NBC affiliate KPRC, Dr. Emanuel continued to claim hydroxychloroquine could be part of a COVID-19 cure. I don't know why people are getting crazy about this. Well, that's a minority view on whether or not it's a okay, cure, that's for sure. let me tell you something. When you have some 300, 400 patients and none of them has died, it is not a minority view. It wasn't clear who to believe. Catholics and other Christians turned to their faith. Without effective treatments, a vaccine seemed to be the only answer. To be clear, I mean, the government on 16th of March, I mean, the prime minister in this country recommended measures which were akin to a voluntary lockdown, and that was made much more formal on the 23rd of March. So in a head-to-head -head competition, it would be difficult to know who better embodies the scientific hypocrisy of the COVID pandemic. Anthony Fauci? If anybody is lying here, Senator, it is you. Or British researcher Neil Ferguson. The people responsible for lockdown. It was Ferguson, known as Professor Lockdown, who put panic in the pandemic. To understand his impact, return to March 2020. The world was about 60 days into the unfolding drama. Italy saw the largest number of cases outside of China. The entire country went into quarantine on March 9th. Then Ireland, followed by Denmark, Bulgaria, and a number of other countries locked down. On March 13th, Pornhub graciously stepped in to help. After offering free subscriptions in Italy, Spain, and France, Adult entertainment site Pornhub is making its subscription free for everyone across the world with a view to help to flatten the curve amid lockdowns around the world. Great Britain and the United States resisted the Chinese communist lockdown strategy until March 16th, when Neil Ferguson's team published its pandemic projections predicting 510,000 deaths in Great Britain and 2.2 million deaths in the United States if lockdown measures were not implemented. Breaking news tonight, millions of Americans ordered to shelter in place as the coronavirus pandemic spreads. The media responded immediately and so did government. On March 19th, Gavin Newsom announced his decision. There's a recognition of our interdependence that requires of this moment that we direct a statewide order for people to stay at home. Lockdowns became the rule of the day throughout most of the world, all based on a faulty statistical model and following a Chinese communist pandemic management system. Ferguson's modeling was widely criticized in the scientific community. Let's look at some of Neil Ferguson's work in the past and see how accurate it's been. For bird flu, he estimated using his very sophisticated models, there might be 200 million deaths globally. There were in fact, 282. Referring to the British government's response to lockdown, the Daily Skeptic concluded its analysis. We abandon our carefully planned and rehearsed pandemic preparedness plans in favor of an experimental measure on the basis of non-peer reviewed, undocumented, obscure, predictively inaccurate modeling using a design that leaves out one of the most important variables involved, created by an expert with apparently no formal training in computer modeling or epidemiology and a track record of very high overestimates of disease mortality. 
Nevertheless, the mainstream media, including the well-known British journal Nature, championed Ferguson's lockdown strategy. Nature claimed a neuroscientist and other scientists had verified the code behind the modeling simulation, but the article didn't include a single scientist's name for independent confirmation. The virus outbreak has been riddled with miscalculations and misguided projections. Here are just a few headlines. Florida Department of Health says CDC reported inaccurate COVID-19 data. Cuomo admits mistakes over nursing home death data. California COVID-19 data is inaccurate and incomplete. How are COVID-19 deaths counted? It's complicated. Minnesota lawmakers say coronavirus deaths inflated. My prediction of 100,000 cases per day was wrong, admits Professor Neil Ferguson. An atmosphere of not irrational distrust began developing across the globe. What is 3-3-2021? This year, on the 3rd of March. Guess what? What? Really? Lockdown may have saved lives, but it also had many victims. On March 13, 2020, President Trump declared the virus outbreak a national emergency. To unleash the full power of the federal government in this effort today, I am officially declaring a national emergency. In imitation of China's handling of the pandemic, the United States went into lockdown. Schools closed. All public venues closed. Restaurants, bars, sporting events, gyms. Americans confined to their homes were to come out only for essential services. Receiving any of the sacraments was not considered essential. No weddings, last rites, funerals, baptisms. The elderly, the virus's favorite target, died alone without family, without the comfort of a final confession. Hey, Dad. I know you can hear us. You see your eyes opening. It's just so special to see you. There's so many people have just been asking about you. President Trump's hope of reopening the country by Easter was mocked by health officials in the media. And why isn't the president talking about a way to sort of walk and chew gum at the same time and figure out a way to try uh, and do that rather, rather than saying, you know, this is all going to be raring to go by Easter? Doctor, what do you think? Uh, I think uh, she's absolutely right. This is not about a slogan. The lockdown also presented the opportunity for tyrants to emerge, and they were everywhere. A man paddleboarding alone at Malibu Beach was arrested. A family was ousted from a plane when their toddler couldn't tolerate wearing a mask. While the elderly and health-compromised seniors died on ventilators in hospitals, children were enduring a kind of suffering that has the potential to last their entire lives. Entire states were kept from dining indoors with friends or getting haircuts because governors, well, they had an opportunity for power and they took it. Over time, few of the tyrants were able to keep their own rules. One by one, as the virus spread, so did the hypocrisy. It was a two-day trip. I wasn't out partying in Miami. Politicians with authoritarian tendencies were unmasked as they abused the power the pandemic had granted them. The head pastor, Father Milton Ryan, approaches me. He says, and this is a direct quote, I am the boss here. I am the pastor. What I say goes. Now, if you want to be an obedient Catholic, you put that mask on. The COVID pandemic and lockdown brought out the worst in the American Catholic hierarchy. Tonight, a California church is fighting back against the cease and desist order. While other religious groups fought for the right to assemble, American bishops like Ducks to Water adapted to live-streamed masses and quickly closed parish doors. And so I encourage you to pray together each day in your homes and to participate in the masses available at any time online. There was little outrage among them when abortion mills continued operating and were designated an essential service. Some priests allowing limited in-person mass attendance instituted scandalous rules for reception of Holy Communion, refusing communion on the tongue, 
requiring the wearing of gloves and masks and slathering on hand sanitizer. One suburban parish in Cleveland instituted drive through reception of the Eucharist, distributing the host in baggies through vehicle windows. Those who plan on attending holiday masses in person will want to check with their local parish to see if they need a reservation. Using the abundance of caution excuse, some parishes and dioceses went beyond CDC requirements, refusing to hear confession, banning choir singing, or requiring reservations to attend mass. Bishops furloughed staff and engaged high-dollar lawyers and accountants to apply for emergency government assistance, known as PPP funds. By one estimate, American Catholic dioceses received $1.4 billion in government pandemic funds. Despite the influx of government dollars, bishops used the pandemic to lay off low-level chancery workers. The Archdiocese of New Orleans is laying off 19 employees amidst the coronavirus pandemic. In contrast, Protestant churches defied lockdown orders and rejected the government's ruling that they were non-essential. I'm not against masks in the sense if someone wants to wear one, wear one. But I'm not a policeman, I'm a pastor. In Canada, defiant pastors were arrested and jailed. I am to place both of them under arrest for breaching the Queen's bench order. This is it, and um, you know, I just think um, COVID is God's gift to the left. When U.S. lockdowns began in March, the election primaries were in full swing, with the 2020 presidential election eight months away. No one was sure what the progress of the virus would be. Thanks to the highly controversial 2018 Georgia gubernatorial election between Democrat Stacey Abrams and Republican Brian Kemp, voter suppression became the Democrats' favorite accusations as they expanded opportunities for voter fraud. Abrams lost by 50,000 votes and refused to call Kemp the duly elected governor. It was in March 2020, at the peak of the virus panic, that the Democrat Party met with Georgia Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger to discuss its election-related lawsuit against the state. Those negotiations finalized the notorious settlement agreement creating rules about absentee voter signature matching, rules that bypass the state's legislature. Georgians got a taste for what that would mean in the June 2020 primary. On to Decision 2020, the protests energizing Georgians to vote in tomorrow's primary. And the state says it's already seen a surge in turnout for early and absentee voting, with 80% of the votes being cast are mail-in. Georgia wasn't the only state, Michigan, Pennsylvania and Wisconsin also imposed voting rules that were not approved by the state's legislatures. Texas allowed drive-through voting, and in Georgia, signatures on thousands of mail-in ballots weren't properly verified, while ballot bundles were illegally dumped into ballot boxes. COVID created the opportunity for this election chaos. Today, I want to update you on the next stage of this momentous medical initiative. It's called Operation Warp Speed. That means big and it means fast. A massive scientific, industrial, and logistical endeavor unlike anything our country has seen since the Manhattan Project. In his announcement of Operation Warp Speed, an all-out pan-agency effort to develop a COVID vaccine by the end of 2020, as director of NIAID, Fauci has spent his entire career on vaccine development. First, for the human immunodeficiency virus, HIV, that created the AIDS pandemic in the 1980s, and then 20 years later, following the SARS COVID-1 outbreak. But after years of research, millions of dollars, and the use of dangerous gain-of-function research techniques, Fauci and NIAID failed to produce a vaccine for either virus. Many Americans believe researchers have still failed to produce a safe and effective vaccine. And I think there was a kind of almost a social contract set up between the vaccine recipients and the governments and uh, public health authorities. 
And that, that social contract was, despite what you may have heard about the risks of some of these products and the fact that we admittedly did rush them, we're protecting your health. If you take these products, you will be safe. That's the social contract. Despite all these other concerns, you will be safe and you won't have to retake them. Within months of its launch, Pfizer disclosed its experimental vaccine wasn't as durable as hoped. For the tens of millions of Americans inoculated with the Pfizer vaccine, tonight new word, they'll likely need a third shot, a booster dose, within 12 months of being fully vaccinated. Simultaneously, the world learned taking the vaccine had risks. Like any other medical intervention, it wasn't across the board safe. Knowing the likelihood of at least some adverse reactions, the U.S. government granted pharmaceutical companies complete immunity from any civil actions seeking damages. The CDC has received 1,200 plus preliminary reports of myocarditis and pericarditis following about 300 million total doses of the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines. But the media tells us vaccine deaths are rare. That type of reaction tends to be very rare. It's still very incredibly rare. Exponentially greater than a rare complication. Doctors are reminding us of just how rare Powell's COVID complications were. VITT is an extremely rare blood clotting disorder. We're again in one of those moments where there's uh, chaos. It's the absolute absence of humanity of these leaders. They are willing to allow people to die. They don't care about human life. They don't value. They are prepared to let millions of people die if that's what it takes to protect their regime. Why would the NIH change their gain of function web pages? No, I don't think it should be mandatory. I don't think it should be mandatory. I don't think it should be mandatory. May this appointment today be the first of many more to come. I think history will judge me by what I've done. All you want is submission to a lie. As you can hear the chants from the, the crowd, Let's go, Brandon. You don't have to do everything your parents say, and you don't have to believe everything your parents believe. Washington State football coach Nick Rolovich has been fired for refusing to comply with state vaccine mandates. None of her fellow passengers did anything to help. You're teaching children to hate others because of their skin color. We will not comply! No four shots! No four shots! We've been patient, but our patience is wearing thin.